Well, as you've heard a couple of times uh, already this evening, I was born uh, in England to parents from India, and we moved to California when I was seven, and I actually started going to school by plane uh, at the age of nine. Um, and I think that really turned out in retrospect to be a crash course in uh, cultural fascination, the, the ways cultures dream of one another, the way cultures project their longings, their hopes, their suspicions um, and resentments on one another. Uh, when I began flying back and forth between England and California, it was 1968, so California was in the midst of the summer of love and the revolution that was raising all the discernible foundations of life uh, to ashes in a sense, uh, and what was waiting for me at the other end was a boarding school that, if you can believe it, was founded in 1441. Uh, the, the walls couldn't have been more ap opposite and therefore couldn't have been more fascinated by one another. Um, certainly in those days, my sense was that almost every little English boy had only one dream in life, that was to be a Californian. Um, <laughs> California you know, is the home of, of freedom and opportunity of long horizons, of the chance of freeing yourself from the past and reinventing yourself. And many of the Californians I knew, I felt, longed more than anything for the sense of continuity and stability, the solid ground underneath their feet that Britain has um, in abundance. And I think, uh, in some ways, that's been my theme ever since. The first chapter of my first book, uh, I described an American man and, and a Philippine woman dancing with one another, neither knowing how much he's attracted by the other and how much by the other's culture and how much there's an illusion involved and how much there's real knowledge or, or, or craving. Uh, and in recent years, having followed that theme for quite a bit, I've become more interested in perhaps the, the products of cultural convergence, what happens when people meet across cultures, uh, by which I mean that when a German man, for example, goes to Thailand, meets and perhaps marries a Thai woman, the little children who arise out of that union are not German, not Thai, but something utterly unprecedented, radical and different. And I think they represent one of the great hopes of the new century we're entering outside um, the old categories, just as Kaz was uh, describing um, so eloquently in his introduction, beholden to no tradition and yet having access uh, to many. And I think one thing that I like about cultural convergence is that it throws into chaos all our easy ideas about which are the rich cultures, which are the poor, which are the colonizers, which are colonized, who's in a position of power and who's in a position of, of powerlessness. Uh, I suppose, as much as anything, when I travel, the reason I travel is to explode my simple assumptions. I find when I'm sitting in California, I'll tell myself that I know everything about North Korea or Syria or Ethiopia or El Salvador. And when I, when I go to any of those countries, and I've spent a fair amount of time in all of them, I, as soon as I arrive, I see that all my ideas were wrong. The first thing that happens when I disembark from the plane is that my stereotypes are overturned. Uh, so I think my, my writing for me is an attempt to um, throw a hand grenade into my own ideas. Uh, a few years ago, when I went back to India, my parents' homeland, I decided to read it, quite literally, through its road signs, through the ways in which uh, India uses English, and in some ways has taken on and taken over the legacy that the British Empire um, bestowed uh, upon it. Uh, and again, um, as the more you look into this, I feel, the more your notion of who is victim and who is victimizer begins to blur a little. So I thought I'd read um, a little bit from this chapter from my most recent book that just came out in paperback, I think, this week, called Sun After Dark. Um, and this is a journey through India. <clears throat> the assault began, really, as soon as I set foot in my parents' India last year. If aggrieved, said the sign in the Bombay Customs Hall, please consult Assistant Commissioner Customs. I wasn't sure that Assistant Commissioner Customs was very keen to see me, and besides, I was mostly aggrieved by that extra T in assistant, but still, I proceeded, head held high, into the merry mayhem. On one side of me was a sign offering a liquor permit, on the other, whatever a car hailer might be when he's at home. On the far end of the hall, where I went to change my dollars, a sign informed me gravely, please ensure that your drawers are locked properly. <laughs> Looking down to make sure that all was as it should be with my underwear, I, I stepped out into the gloom and found myself inside a wheezing knockoff of an ancient Morris Oxford. A free left turn was to the right of me, a passenger alighting point was to the left, and on every other side, the ceaseless Indian anarchy was in full and vocal swing. Buses saying, silence please, on their sides. The mud guards of trucks responding, horn okay, please. And my own little car making its own small contribution to democracy with a sticker on the back window, blow your horn, pay a fine. 
India is the most chattery country in the world, it often seems, and it comes at you in almost 200 languages, 1,652 dialects, and a million signs that scream from every hoarding, car hailer, and passing shop. But the strangest effect of all, for many a visitor from abroad, is that the signs are just familiar enough to seem completely strange. We passed a textorium as we jangled into town and a toilet complex. <laughs> we passed the clip joint beauty clinic, the Tinkerbell Primary School, and Nota Bene, Cleaners of Distinction. <laughs> One apartment block advised all passers-by, no parking for outsiders. If found guilty, all tires will be inflated with extreme prejudice. <laughs> <clears throat> Feeling more than a little prejudice myself now, I looked around in search of more useful guidance. Yogic laughter is multidimensional, a sign in front of a decaying Dickensian manse in for me. Beside it, between some pictures of chunky Technicolor movie stars, a board advised, dark glasses make you attractive to the police. <laughs> I could only imagine that they, like most of the notices around me, had been fashioned by some proud graduate of the course I'd seen advertised in the national paper flying in. We make you a big boss in English conversation, hypnotize people by your highly impressive talks, exclusive courses for exporters, business tycoons. <laughs> in any other country in the world, duly hypnotized and impressed, I would have stopped there. Taking note of English misplaced in translation or imperfectly learned is not a very useful exercise, especially if you cannot speak any of the almost 200 languages yourself. My Hindi, non-existent, would have provoked more than multidimensional yogic laughter. Yet all the miscegenated signs in India speak for something more than just linguistic mangling and something more poignant. They clutch at you a little with the plaintiveness of a child of a secret union that neither of its parents will acknowledge. A little, in fact, like that sad-eyed man who comes up to you outside your hotel in once British Indian Aden and asks if you'd like to see the cemetery. I'm entirely Indian by blood, though born in England, and yet I never saw the incongruous merging of those cultures in their prime, or even the protracted divorce that followed upon their falling apart. But even for me, and even 50 years after what is known as independence, a large part of the romance of India lies in the culverts and civil list houses, the cantonments and canteens that still dot the hill stations and tropical valleys of their subcontinent. In their day, they stood for occupation, even oppression. But now, soothed by history's progress and standing for a liaison that neither party sought, they speak for something more wistful to do with colonizer colonized. And language, the words that startle and bewilder on every side, hints at something that official historians and politicians overlook. As you walk past an officer's mess across from a sign for the Bombay color sergeants, you feel yourself in some way unique, not quite past and not quite present, the realm of English or Inglian or whatever you wish to call a curious marriage of inconvenience. On my trip across the subcontinent last year, I was able with some effort to work out what free foot service might be, in a temple no less, and even to deduce what fingers stood for in a menu, that shortened film of finger chips or those kind of potatoes that the British are always loath to call French fries. More than once, I found out the hard way what it is to have a meeting pre-perned on you. But always, I felt that I was speaking a language quite different from the English being spoken all around me. More Indians, of course, speak English than Englishmen. And came to feel that the one companion who'd been with me with all my life, the English language, had stolen away into a corner and come back in a turban, a finger to its lips. <laughs> to travel through India today, therefore, especially if you're following it through its English language signs, is to see at every turn one culture getting under another's skin and into its heart and mouth and dreams. And the effect is intensified because the cultures of South Asia seem never to throw anything away but simply take it all in and stir it up into the mix. You may occasionally be able to tell what's being said to you. Do not cross verge or watch for shooting stones, but any resemblance to the language you think you know is purely coincidental. As I went up into the Himalaya last year, past mouldering Anglican churches whose plaques recalled gallant soldiers killed by a bear, in the midst of life we are in death, I was given instructions at every turn. If married, divorce to speed, or do not nag while I am driving. <laughs> the value of these injunctions was only faintly undone by the fact that I still don't know what most of them mean. 
And even when, by some miracle, you can follow the words, they seem to bite their own tails by being placed in sentences that do everything they can to undermine their own solemnity. Indian English, when it's not overly formal, comes at you with the fatal tinkle of an advertising man who's got his hands on the Ten Commandments. There's always a trace of sententiousness in it, and yet the lofty sentiments are placed inside the jingly sing-song of a children's ditty. A decade before, traveling across my stepmotherland, as I think of it, I'd been struck by the signs that said, lane driving is sane driving, or no hurry, no worry. But now they'd been joined by half a hundred others, trilling, reckless drivers kill and die, leaving all behind to cry. <laughs> or, a little more potently, risk taker is accident maker. As I drove out of little settlements crammed with such instructions, the signs offered brightly, thanks for inconvenience. And the majesty of such slogans is only slightly diminished by the fact that 500 million Indians cannot read a word of any language, let alone the Jinglish commemorated on its roads, and show no sign at all of being swayed by, let us solicit the serenity of silence, blow horn if you must. <laughs> it can seem as if a whole new language had been dreamed up by a clergyman in cahoots with a mischievous schoolboy. <laughs> They've drawn their inspiration from Lewis Carroll and pledged themselves to turn V.S. Naipaul on his head. Never use one word when 30 will suffice, they seem to say. <laughs> Never use a simple locution if a complicated one will serve. Honor your felicitations as if you were an affectee. If you don't blow your horn after all, who will? <laughs> a ceremony should be quite pompous, a friend declared with sweet innocence as I stepped into a marriage hall in Bombay. And I recall that one Mem Sahib who had never sailed back to England was Mrs. Malaprop. And when I, <coughs> and when I opened the Times of India, Invitation price, two rupees, it declares inscrutably on its cover. I found a whole section devoted to matrimonial notices in which prospective brides were glowingly described as homely, artful, and wheat-colored, which <laughs> in the crazed logic of Indian English means domestically minded, culturally inclined, and fair-skinned. Even at Hare Krishna land, the center of the International Study for Krishna Consciousness, the sign at the entrance extolled its gurus, quote, large propaganda program. And inside, in the center school, a smaller board offered tips for blooming manners. You do not have to be much of a polemicist to see in this cheerful mingling of proportions how a country of the poor can somehow make the playthings of the rich its own, and in that very act contrive to give the things a gravity and an innocence they would never have at home. India, of course, is the home of Sanskrit and of complex philosophies that little in Britain has ever matched. But what struck me as I went through some of the least privileged parts of Bombay was how the most ramshackle huts call themselves marriage palaces. And old buses, if they did not style themselves stage carriages, had semi-deluxe written on their sides or naughty on their front. Even the most broken establishments, especially those perhaps, call themselves honesty or reliable or dreamer's delight, as if words still had a sympathetic magic here, and just to invoke equality was to bring its blessing down amongst us. We start, perhaps, by laughing at the follies of another culture's misappropriations. We move towards bewilderment as we sense that we're not quite in the culture that we left and yet not in the one we think we're going to. And we end up somewhere completely different, not quite irony, not quite romance. As I prepared to fly out of New Delhi last year, be like Venus, unarmed, instructed the sign at the airport beside me. As, it, as I began to fly out of Delhi last year, I began to wonder how far I was really going. Blighty, after all, is the Hindi word for foreign. Thank you so much.